Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right. Uh, hi, my name is Rob. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, my sobriety date is January 1st, 2008. My home group is Queen Anne Study, 7 o'clock on Sunday nights. A little bit of a conflict with your group, so. <laughs> but if you ever find yourself late to this meeting and you need to catch a meeting, <laughs> head up there. Um, I have uh, a sponsor. He's here. I have uh, some sponsees. They're here. Um, and that's, uh, I'm a big fan of this program. So um, thanks for asking me to share and thanks for giving me a, a reason to wear a suit. Um, and I really, they said business casual. I'm like, I have jeans and I have one suit. What are you going to do? You know, so I'm, I'm limited. But um, uh, I'm going to share uh, my experience, strength, and hope. Um, I'm going to read some stuff from the big book. I'm a big fan of it. Um, and I'll just uh, and share a little bit of my story and uh, tell you what's, up, what's going on. Uh, I'll just read this first part. Um, when I came in and I read the book with a sponsor and I heard it read, um, I found some hope in this. Um, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women. This is the forge of the first edition, so this is way back in the day, back in 39. Uh, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have we recovered is the main purpose of this book. So I heard that and I'm like, okay, good. There's, there's, there's hope. Um, I like that whole thing. I can recover. It's like, okay, good. And, and there, maybe there's some hope for me. Um, I was born and raised in, uh, up the hill, Finney Ridge. Um, I'm the youngest of four. Um, uh, my parents didn't drink. Um, I think um, my older brother and my two sisters, they're not alcoholics. Um, I think I saw like my, in the summertime, maybe my dad would have one Rainier beer in the back of the fridge he said, because he was just tired of drinking water or pop. He's like, every, I mean, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't like one of those things. I hear people's stories. Everyone's got their own path. And that's one, when I big, I'm a big fan of that. Everyone's got their own path. But um, I'm sure we feel a lot alike when we put that alcohol in our systems. Um, that's a big similarity. Um, I, uh, gosh, I went kindergarten through 12th grade at a private school up in North Seattle called King's. Um, uh, you know. Like I had a loving family. I went to uh, I went to a church down the street. I went to an Episcopal church. Grew up in a loving church, uh, loving God, loving forgiving God. So you know, no horror stories about that. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this because I, when I first came in, I was I was asking myself, well, what's what's my excuse? Why am I? You know, why am I? I had a, I had a, I hear some people's stories, and I'm like, yes, I would drink. Yes, you're right. I would drink if I were you. Um, but. Uh, you know, I just, uh, I, I think there was a time in my life where I didn't drink alcoholically, um, but then there was that time when I couldn't stop. So, uh, and uh, that feeling of like, like you said, waking up in the morning, just like, oh, why? You know, I couldn't look myself in the mirror. And um, I didn't, uh, I drank a couple times in high school. Um, I remember my uh, my grandmother, um, I believe when I was 12, I was at a, at a, at a family wedding over in Bellevue and uh I just have a distinct memory of like her teaching me telling me how to drink champagne not like hey you gotta chug you know but she was like we had there were the glass champagne things and it was good champagne and she's like yeah let it trickle down the back of your throat and uh and it was uh, it was cool she was cool uh I, I I liked it um you know funny thing was her husband who I never met my grandpa um was an alcoholic he was the he was the one guy that that died of alcoholism in the family. I'm named after him. I'm I'm Robert. F he was Robert. F Coincidence? I don't, I don't know. Who think? Um, but uh, you know, I was in, in in college. I went to UW and I was in a fraternity. And and for a while, I didn't drink in the fraternity because it was too cliche. It's like I don't mean Kager. Eh. But you know, I would go I would go out and we would drink other places. Um, and yeah, I drinking was fun. The conviviality. The, there, there's a part in the book that talks about it. There was a time when it was fun. And, uh, and the consequences weren't great. Um, uh, you know, you drank with people who drank, and then um, through different stages of life, people just stopped drinking, and I just kept drinking. Um, 
And it was, but you know, there were fun stories. There were war stories after the night. You know, we'd get together. What happened to you last night? Well, I ended up here and I ended up there and I ended up passed out in my car. I don't know how I got there and all that. And, uh, but there was never anybody going, man, Rob, you've got a drinking problem because I hung out with people that drank. Um, and, uh, to point the finger at me or them, they'd be pretty much pointing the finger at themselves. And so there was never like, there was never the consequences. Um, and drinking was fun. And I, after college, I ended up, I went down to Arizona for work and, uh, did a lot of drinking at work. I mean, with, with the, the, you know, the presidents of the, of the, I worked for AT&T Wireless and we opened a market there in 97 and, Man, we drank. I, I got promotions at, at after parties drinking with, you know, I mean, like, hey, you should work for my team or there's a spot open here. And so it's like, how could I have a problem if I'm I'm doing OK at work and I've, I've got a girlfriend, fiance and this and that. And it's like and we all drink and party and we drink we drink good wine. And um, I like but I like Bud Light and, and cheap vodka um, it just went down smooth. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was like. But, but, you know, stuff started to happen, though, like, uh, you know, hurting, hurting loved ones, um, cheating on girlfriends, just, you know, that whole, like, I was really hammered. I have no idea what happened. You know, it won't happen again kind of thing. I did a lot of those. Gosh, yeah, that was terrible. It won't happen again. And I went through periods in my life. It, it talks in there, too, about the ways that we have tried. You know, we, we switched drinks. Uh I, I switched to Michelob Ultra while I was training for a marathon. <laughs> you got to drink a lot of Michelob Ultra to get drunk. I mean, it's just impossible. But, you know, that was, okay, I, I can't be an alcoholic. And then, like, uh, one year, I, uh, for New Year's resolution, I'm not going to drink for a month. I thought I was the man. I thought that was the biggest thing ever. But then I caught up in February for everything I messed up. <laughs> you know, but that kind of stuff. I can't be an alcoholic. I quit it for a month, you know. I was a designated driver for a while. Um, but there was always, and maybe I'd be fine for a while, but there was those times when I just, wasn't you know i mean one or two drinks that just sounds like hell to me who would want just one or two drinks um and uh and then but then after a while like you know 30 drinks wasn't enough just wouldn't you know one's too many um hunter's not enough um and so there was no i mean i really had i guess i i could see when i did my amends when i did my my um list of people i'd harm all this stuff i could see where i had caused wreckage throughout but you know it wasn't like there was no um, didn't get arrested, didn't get a DUI. I have no idea how I didn't get a DUI. Um, I got pulled over, um, drunk by a statey on, on 520 on the bridge. Uh, I had been drinking. I mean, I'd played basketball game and had drank in Fremont. And then I was driving across to go to my girlfriend's house and got pulled over. I don't know how, I, don't, I have no idea how I didn't get, uh, busted. Um, but it wasn't my time, I guess. Um, and, uh, I had interactions with the police, but they were more kind of. My, my brother-in-law was a police officer, and I, I, we got my buddy and I got pulled over by some mountain bike cops. He was driving, and I was in the passenger seat, and <laughs> and I, I, he was telling me to shut up, but I took it. My, I felt it my responsibility to say, I know so and so, my brother-in-law. I know him. Get him down here, you know. And then I ran off, and the cops were like. I had to call the police the next day, the two guys, because my brother-in-law was like, these are the guys, give them a call, I had to apologize. Um, <laughs> idiot. They were just like, dude, I just ran <laughs> down a Pike Place Market. It's just, yeah, just a mess. But it was a funny it was a funny story, and we got a kick out of it, and I felt bad for a little bit, and I apologized to those cops, and that was, but, uh, but no one ever said, gosh, Rob, you, man, you can't have a problem. It was just kind of, uh, my parents, like I said, my family had no idea. I, I, I my, my grandpa died of it, but I don't think he was in the program or he had been taught. It was just like he drank himself to death. No one said, gosh, Rob, maybe you – just nothing. Um, I don't, I'm not blaming them. I'm just saying that was the, my reality was just I didn't – I thought AA was for ex-cons and, and old dudes who I used to see stumble home from the old Lobo Hem Tavern, which is now the Snowy Snow Goose Saloon. Up. There was an old tavern on the corner. They'd stumble down the hill. And uh remember my dad one, one time, he said – uh because I, he, he actually, I worked for him because he was a contractor, and I did some did some independent contracting with him. And I, he, I was like, well, I'm not. I mean, gosh, Dad, I'm not. I'm not a. I was. I had some excuse for my drink, and he goes, well, you don't see me. I'm not one of those guys stumbling down the hill. Like he, he didn't take my my excuse or my whatever I was trying to tell him. And uh, and he was right. It was like I was always full of like ducking and dodging. Well, I'm on a down cycle, or you don't understand my situation. 
or I just, you know, shuck and jive my way out of a situation and um, laugh it off and try to, I think I'm charming, but I'm not. Um, I would think try to charm my way out of stuff. Um, so uh, we moved, I moved back from Arizona and um, I got laid off from 18 to hours in 04. And I'm, I'm telling you this because this is when the wheels started to kind of come off. Um, and I took my severance package and, and um, bought it. it into I, I bought a bar in Fremont. Um, <laughs> it was my it was my best friend owned it with his partner, and I bought his partner out. And um, and uh, it, don't go into a business with your best friend. That's one rule. And uh, if you're an alcoholic, don't go into it and buy a bar. Uh, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But uh, um, and so uh, that's when um, yeah, I mean. I we, I did fine for a while, and then um, um, drugs are a part of my story. But I'm an alcoholic. But uh, I I like the kind of drugs that could help me drink more. Those were nice. Um, and so and it was just in the yeah like you say hanging out in the restaurant and bar business. It's like and no one's gonna call you out because everyone is a wreck. Uh, and I can say that because I'm I was a wreck. Um, um, and well, the funny thing was we uh, we actually hosted a. Um, an A meeting every morning there uh, at like seven or whatever. And there'd be times where like my bar manager would be passed out back there. They have to kind of bump him to get him out. And I, I was never there. I was always downstairs. Like if I, if I got in a fight with my girlfriend, I'd sleep in the office downstairs and I could hear the back door open and close. And I knew that the, the A people were there and, and I, and I would get the rent check from him once in a while, and I would try to avoid eye contact and <laughs> let, pretend that I'd been there. I, I just got there, but in, in reality, I'd slept in the office. And gosh, I knew that the guy it was David W. was the guy's name, and I wish I've never bumped into him in a meeting um, in the seven and a half years. But I would love to love to see the guy um, and just kind of have a chuckle about that. But uh, <clears throat> I got my girlfriend pregnant in. Uh, Gosh, September 11th, 06, I got the phone call. Um, I'm weird with dates. I'm really weird, but it was September 11th. But it was, yeah, I, um, she said, come on over. We have to talk. And um, I was making up some excuse that I had to be at the office. That It was like a Monday night. I'd, I'm doing the books at the office down, and I was just drinking and drugging. Um, so I got there, and she said she was pregnant. And, man, I, I had no idea what to do. Um, I can't raise somebody. I'm, I'm a mess. Um but uh, I'm really glad. I mean, I didn't get, I mean, I, I, I'm a believer, too, that it's something in here has to click. There's no outside circumstances. I, hey, I have a kid. i got to get sober. Well, there's a lot of drunk parents. I'm a, you know, I was a drunk parent for a, almost a year. Um, or, you know, um, gosh, i got to have a girlfriend i got to keep or a wife got to keep uh, so I can't drink. It's like, no. I mean, that's, none of that stuff was going to keep. I, I had to have something click inside of here. And... Um, so he was born in early 07 and then I was good for a while. Um, cause, cause I was there and I was there and when he was delivered and I helped through the early portion of the whole, uh, when he was younger, but then it was like a couple months in, I'm like, well, I'm not breastfeeding. I can probably have some. And then it was like, in that summer of 07 was like, well, it's, you know, I don't have, have a connection with him because he wants his mom all the time. So, I mean, I was off and running. And so summer of 07, the wheels really started coming off. Um, I I got, this is, I mean, it was just this kind of stuff that I got 86th from a two-year-old's birthday party. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, I I, found, I thought it would be funny to, to fire up the, the weed whacker and put on some safety goggles and come around the backyard. A couple, couple guys laughed, but <laughs> it was, I was, it was kind of fuzzy at that point. Um, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I was hammered at that point. Um, so I, I left there and stumbled, and somehow ended up at the uh, back of my bar. And uh, my bar manager still has the pictures of that. He hasn't sent them to me yet, or deleted them. I asked him the other day. I'm like, can I get those pictures? Um, but uh, that was when I think. That's when that was the whole like, dude, you got to stop. Uh, I, she, my girlfriend said you got to, or you'll never see us again, kind of thing. So that woke me up for a, a minute. Um, I remember I went and sat in at some um, rehab facility over on 
Lake Washington, not, it's not, not, I mean, Lake Union, it's not, not Lakeside Milan. There was another one, some alternative, I don't know what it was called, but I sat in on a session and they entered, they, they did an assessment of me and I lied to them. And, but no one said, no one ever said, do you maybe you should go to AA or whatever. It was more like, I tried that and then I'll be off, I'll be fine. But then I got kicked out again. So that whole, the rest of, so summer to the end of 07, I was couch surfing and, um, I, you know, estranged from my, my son who was, you know, eight, eight months at that time, nine months. And, um, uh, and then it was basically, you have to, they, they thought I had a drug problem. Um, they said, you got to stop this or you'll never see us again. So I, I thank, um, the mother of my child for, for that. Uh, cause then I went into rehab. It's, I don't think it's even there anymore. I think the options were sundown or this is, I went to Highland court in Port Angeles which was, um, gosh, it was just bare bones. It was what I needed. I mean, there was, I heard all about sundown afterward. I'm like, I wish I'd have been there, man. <laughs> but I don't, I, I was on my path. And so when I, I went into rehab, um, I, for whatever reason, I started listening. Um, and I mean, I, I initially identified myself as, whatever, an addict. I, I didn't know. And we had meetings in the, they would come in, we'd have meetings every night, it would flip-flop, NA, AA, whatever. And those were my first experience with meetings. But still, I had no no real clue or any idea. I was so fuzzy, so fuzzy in the head then. But um, I I threw myself into it and, and did all the work they asked me to do. And I did the assessment with them and I was honest. And she was like, you are a late-stage alcoholic. Um, and uh, And I got out and um, went uh, make my first meeting in Seattle because they said when you get out you're gonna go to AA you're gonna get a sponsor you're gonna get a home group I had no idea what that stuff meant I just really didn't um, I'm like okay I'll do that um, I stopped the whole debate thing I said I just said okay I'm done I surrender and that's where I talk about how it just kind of clicks in your heart like I can see I can see people I interact with people and I'm like dude you need to get sober but I can't get anybody sober I can't get anybody drunk. Um, so what if, for whatever reason, something clicked in here and I said, man, I'm screwed. I got to stop. So I went to my first AME was a Saturday afternoon. Uh, I, I actually was trying to find an NA meeting down at St. Mo at, at uh, St. Paul's and I bumped into a guy, he was coming out when I was going in and he at that time had probably about 15 years, maybe uh, 15 years of sobriety. And I had, I played, I used to play cart poker with him. After, like late night after hours cash games downtown in this bar and uh he and i kind of clicked because we were both kind of business guys and and we just kind of clicked and he was odd and i knew he just drank red bulls and i knew he was crazy uh, and and he didn't think that I had a problem but I, I was going into the bathroom between every hand and doing coke and and then just i'm fine i'm not drinking tonight and you know, that kind of stupid thing because my girlfriend could smell stuff on my breath but she couldn't you know couldn't couldn't see the stuff in my nose. So, um, so he was like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I just got out of rehab. I'm trying to find an NA meeting. And he said, it was a good word of advice, but I can't swear. But he's like, man, FNA. He goes, if you want to get and stay sober, go to AA. And so there's every, there's programs for everybody, but I'm glad. And I am an alcoholic. I am a huge alcoholic. So, um, I'm a big fan of it. So he, I actually ended up working with him early on in sobriety, and it was basically like having a – he wasn't my sponsor, but I worked with him. Um, we did some hard manual labor. It was, what I, it was what I needed. I just – I would wake up. I'd go work hard all day, come, go to a meeting, come back home, and then repeat that. And then if I had issues – and I had issues. I had problems. I was like, my girlfriend this, this – and he would just – He'd be there to listen, but I remember him laughing at me a lot of times going, dude, everything's going to be fine. And I was, I was like, no, you don't understand. I, I, this is a unique problem that only I have experienced and I need help with this. And he would just, he would laugh and his, and I needed that. I needed someone to call me on my crap and not like, you know, oh, everything, you know, yeah, I know Rob, it's so tough. Um, <laughs> he would really, I'd, and I'd be so pissed at him. I'd be like, F you, you don't understand. He just laugh. He's like, everything's going to be fine, man. And I don't, and I, and that's, that's one of my lines now when people, I, I don't try to downplay anybody. If someone wants to come to me and vent, I listen, but I always say everything's going to be fine. Um, for me, everything being fine means I cannot put alcohol in, into my system. Okay. That's where we start with there. And then I've learned in this program, there are things that I can do that will 
help my reaction to life. It's not going to get life better because life happens, but my reaction to life um, will definitely change. Um, I got, I don't know how much I got time, but um, I, I marked some things in the book. Um, this is the other thing. I heard this the other week, and I, there are things in the book that I read and read and doesn't resonate, and this thing resonated with me too. It's like um, lack of power. That was our dilemma. I get that. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how are we to find this power? Well, that's the exactly what this book is about. So finding its main objective is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself, which will solve your problem. Wow. I always thought the big book's going to just help me not to drink. Well, that, apparently, the, the main objective is to enable us to find a higher a power greater than ourselves. I needed that. I I had my concept of higher power, but I was playing God the whole the whole most of my life. Um, most of my prayers were God, just get me out of the situation and uh, I'll I'll change kind of thing. Um, God, please help this hangover go away, um, and then I'd be drinking it the next night. So. Um, this book, like I say, I'm glad that I, I had to go through it with a sponsor. I can't go through the stuff on my own in my own head because I can twist things and I can, I'm can. i really good at lying to myself. And that's why I think for so long I didn't really identify as an alcoholic because I'm, and I just, oh, I'm on a bad run, uh, this and that. Or it was, I mean, seriously, how bad of a run do you got to be on to be, you know, living on a couch, uh, you know, selling drugs and just thinking you're going to, everything will be all right next month. Or, you know, it's like, geez, man, I was not honest. But for whatever reason, when I got in these rooms, I was honest, open-minded, and willing. Good gosh. Um, and at baby steps, too. I mean, it's, they, they, I always heard that progress, not perfection. Um, the only thing I've done perfect in seven and a half years is not picked up a drink or a drug. That's the only thing I've done perfect. Um, everything else is just, a man, it's just a, a big one foot in front of the other, try to do the best I can. And... Um, I had to have that psychic change I talk about in here. I had, working the steps, uh, I just, I changed. I don't know how to, how to put it. Uh, and the way I know that is because I'm handling things that used to, before used to really baffle me, um, or send me into isolation, or send me to the bottle. Stuff, so I'm just getting through stuff where it's like, oh, that wasn't too bad. And, and I'm getting thrown stuff all the time. Um, um, what's this page mark for? I have no idea. Okay, this is a good one. Um, because I identify with this guy, too. Um, the alcoholic is like a tornado roaring his way through the lives of others. Hearts are broken. Sweet relationships are dead. Affections have been uprooted. Selfish and inconsiderate habits have kept the home in turmoil. Um, we feel a man is unthinking when he says that sobriety is enough. He is like the farmer who came out of, of a cyclone cellar to find his home ruined. To his wife, he remarked, don't, don't see anything the matter here, Ma. Ain't it grand? The wind stopped blowing. And that was actually, when I first got sober, I really thought, yippee for me. They're going to throw me a parade. Uh, Rob's not drinking anymore. You know, that kind of thing. Well, I needed to, that wasn't, yeah, just not drinking wasn't enough for me. I had to go and do a thorough house cleaning. And, and I had to do a thorough house cleaning as it's written out in the book. And I had to read it to my, you know, my fifth step to a sponsor. Um, he was really great about it, um, and um, I needed to have, like I say, I, I've heard this before too, the, the three things are trust God, clean house, help others, trust God, clean house, help others, and all that is is what I've learned through doing the 12 steps. Um, a lot of the stuff I hear, it's that all sounds well and good in theory. Love and tolerance is our code. That sounds great. Well, when I first came in, I heck no, a judge, judging and not tolerant. Um, but having a psychic change, I can adapt some of these principles a little better, or I can kind of understand them a little bit more. Um, so, like I say, there's a lot of good stuff in here, but I have to do the work in order to kind of reap some of the benefits. Um, for some people, not drinking is enough. That's fine. I've seen people who are like, oh, I don't drink. I go to a meeting or so a month. I'm fine. I'm like, that's not my experience. That's just me, though. I, I have to be involved. I have to go to meetings. I have to pray. I have to work steps. I have to work with others. Um, that's just how it works for me. Um, and then um, as I started to do that, this one, else, I love this one too. And we ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, because everything for me was uh, was reactive on everything. And um, I, 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 I didn't like him. I didn't say I, I thought I was more of a lover, not a fighter. But I mean, I really, I, I would fight people on stuff and look at them. And, and what this program has taught me too, is that I have to clean up my side of the street. 
their side, no matter how messed up I think it is uh, or is in need of cleaning, that's not my that's not my business. Um, and I and I'm learning that, like I say, through doing the steps, and I get to experience that through interactions with the mother of my child. We're not together, but he is in my life. So I remember my counselor in in uh, rehab was always like, because I was like, well, my exit strategy, here's my plan. When I get out, I'm going to get her back, and then I'm this and that. And he was kind of like, but what if it doesn't work out? And I was always like, well, what do you mean? I'm getting sober. <laughs> Stop drinking. You know, she'll forget about all the people I cheated on, you know, on her with. Uh, she'll forget about all the damage I've done because I stopped drinking. But so now I can be a little more responsible, a little less reactive. Um, like I say, it's it's tough sometimes. Um, uh, gosh, I was two years sober and she she moved to, she married a guy and moved to Louisiana. And I fought, I tried to fight it in the courts and this and that, but he ended up going down there with her. My At that time, my son was three. And I remember, I mean, I was, oh, I was in turmoil, but what I did is I upped my meetings, I upped my communication with my sponsor, I upped service work. I'm like, I cannot isolate the situation. And so he, so Jack, it's my, my son's Jackson, he moved down there with his mom. He was three. Um, and it lasted three months. She was back in three months. It was supposed to last like three years. So, and, and, I didn't, and, you know, gosh, I, I remember like when he was gone, it was May of 2010, and I thought, there's nobody up here for me to stay sober for, thinking like I could drink and I wouldn't have to go pick up Jackson next weekend. And like, huh. But I didn't. So that's when I realized, ah, something's working here. I'm interesting. I'm not, I, I could just as easily, but I don't want to. Like, like I say, I, there was, I, I knew at that point, gosh, this stuff, and that was only two years in, and at two years in, stuff was baffling me that now just doesn't even just bother me. So it's like, I knew that, I knew this program worked, and I could see it in other people too. I hear other people talk, I see other people handling life differently, being comfortable in their own skin, um, you know, uh, laughing at some pretty messed up stuff. Um, I, it's, I, I am at home and comfortable in an AA meeting. I mean, I, I go to church, but I get something different from church than I do in here. You know, I mean, I can't. Um, this is this is where I come to to find that that relief. You know, it's just amazing how I can just be full of anxiety for whatever reason. Maybe pop into a room and I'm good. I just feel good and feel right sized. Um, and it's also funny through this whole thing is that I've kind of become the my family's. A drug and alcohol counselor. If, you know, if if so, if a if a second cousin has a problem or so and so's friend, and uh, it's funny. I, I'm glad I can be that person. Um, but all I can say is, here what I here's what I would suggest. They can call me. You know, if it's a female, I'm like I got numbers of girls who would love to talk to her. You know, kind of thing. So, um, it's that attraction, not promotion. I, I've seen that. I mean, it's interesting. People kind of come and find their way to me. Like, hey, hey, you're 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 not drinking, huh? And I'm like, no, not today. Um, and I haven't for a while. But uh, and they can kind of. Uh, it's just interesting how it is. It's that whole thing of attraction, not promotion. I I do not let it be known that I'm. You know, if someone says, hey, you want to drink? I'm always like, I'm good. I'm fine. Um. That's just my thing. You can say I don't drink. I'm not saying how to do it, but I, for me, it's more like I don't think I don't really put it out there a lot. But people, the, the druggies and the alcoholics, seem to find me um, and ask questions, which is cool. And I can share my here's my experience, and, and it's not my responsibility to get them sober, and it's not my responsibility to get them drunk. It's just it's kind of comforting that I'm not in charge of the results because I'm the kind of guy that wants. When I first got a sponsor, I was like a sponsee. I'm like it's got to be perfect. It's got to, and I and I think. My sponsor had me write it in the book. I'm not in charge of the results. And I was like, oh, I, I can grasp that. Um, and then um, what we got here, one more thing. Um, and it's, I'm so, like I said, I'm glad I got to, I'm glad I got to, to share. It's just, uh, um, and I can see there's not a lot of Seahawks fans here. It's, but uh, you know what? It's a stupid game. I mean, really, this is more like this is life and death. To be honest, and I'm a huge, and I'm a diehard sports fan. I really am. Uh, no, I'm I'm a little psychotic, but it's like I can DVR that thing and and watch it later. Um, but uh, where is that page? Um, 
I'm just read one more thing that kind of gets me through. I'm a big fan of the first 164 pages, but there's also some good stuff in the back. And um, this is out of that acceptance was the answer. And um, yeah. And the acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I'm disturbed, it's because I find some person, place, thing, or situation, some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it's supposed to be at this moment. Nothing, absolutely nothing, happens in God's world by mistake. Until I can accept my alcoholism. Oh, yeah. Real quick, real quick. Uh, until I could accept alcoholism, I could not stay sober. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms, I cannot be happy. I need to concentrate not so much on what needs to be changed in the world as on what needs to be changed in me and in my attitudes. So thanks for letting me talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Blair. I am an alcoholic. Hi, Blair. I want to thank my friend Vince and also Teresa for giving me this opportunity to be of service. <coughs> I'm really scared of looking at you guys. Okay. Um, because there's absolutely no better thing for me to be doing today with my life. Um, when I was using and drinking, um, if I had a purpose, it was um, my only safe place was at home in my apartment by myself under the influence of alcohol and drugs. And I'm not going to talk too much about drugs, but it's a big part of my story for anyone who... I just want to say that just so maybe it can help somebody else that's here and has a similar story to mine. Um, my home group is the Counterbalance Group on Wednesday nights. In Queen Anne, I'm grateful to that group for providing me with a service position um, that fell into my lap right when I needed it. I have a sponsor, and I work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anon Anonymous, which is outlined in this book. And if I'm here and I'm going to be abstinent from alcohol and other substances, I need to be working on recovery. That's just for me. I need to be doing the work because um, life is challenging enough doing the work. I can't imagine it without doing the work here. I might as well go right back out if I don't stay in the steps. So I do that to the best of my ability. Um, my sobriety date is April 11th. 2010. I'm very grateful to be above ground today. Um, I need to hear myself say that because whether it's in self-pity or just the way that my brain is wired or, you know, I, I'm desperately trying to change my perspective on my life and recognize my thoughts are not facts and my feelings are not going to kill me. And I don't even, I don't even believe that. So that's why I need to tell you guys that because I really need to believe that. Um, last time I was here, there was a fabulous female speaker up here who retold her story chronologic in chronological order. So I apologize in advance. That's not going to happen. I, I, everything was extremely cloudy. And to be honest, I wish desperately that I could remember better the end of my journey. And, um, <laughs> I wish I had more photographs for the days that uh, I'm serious I'm not joking for the days that I really am thinking about that uh, making that supreme sacrifice but today I'm grateful to say that I am not willing to make that sacrifice that does not mean that I am not acting out in other unhealthy ways because I am um, that's my story lately my little my little rule lately is I'll do anything except for use and drink. And that is my truth. So I'm going to give give it a whirl here. 
Um, I remember when I was a little girl, I had that syndrome, and I don't know where it came from. Uh, I was the little girl in the corner of the playground at elementary elementary school, whatever. I was born um, in Los Angeles, California, to a family with two very loving parents. Um, and I have a younger brother who's two and a half years younger, who is my sun, moon, and stars. Thank, thanks to this program and the steps, he respects me today and he's proud of me. Uh, that was not the case five years ago. Um, so I'm in the corner of the playground and I just don't understand. I caught myself there. I was about to swear. I just don't understand why all the kids are over there playing together and they won't come ask me to come play. Really? So like somewhere around that whole time period, I go home and I tell my mom about it. I'm re I'm really bent out of shape about this too. It doesn't make sense to me. And my mom reveals to me because she's like, my mom is amazing. Um, she, she told me the truth that day and she told me I had to be my own best friend and that broke my heart. It really did. <laughs> it was really rough. And, uh, that is not true to this day. I have not achieved that whatsoever. Um, I would never in a million years treat somebody else, whether I don't like them or not, the way that I treat myself. And I kind of thought about that today, and I was, I was really just thinking a little too much about it, because I can't figure that sort of thing out, you know? And I've read and been told in these rooms that it's not my job to figure this stuff out, you know? It's really not. Um, it's none of my business what my higher powers plan is for me. And I like that, but at the same time, um, I've really been blocking myself because I'm, I'm getting in the way. So the theme for the last week is letting go for me. <clears throat> so she told me I had to be my own best friend. And I hate hearing about, like, I'll hear it in songs, and I'll, other people have told me that, like, I can't be loved if I don't love myself. And then they tell us, we'll love you till you love yourself in these rooms. And I get really confused, and I really, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know why I'm a, not a big fan of myself. I'm just not. You know, but I do know that my heart is good. That's one thing I can say about myself with confidence. Um, and I feel, honestly, it's to my detriment. Um, I feel like my sensitive, my sensitivity is to my detriment. Um, I'm tired of hearing the, oh, it's great to be sensitive. It's great to be sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> when I mix narcotics with alcohol for the first time in my life, I didn't care what you thought about me. And I can't get back there, no matter how hard I try. I would do anything, except for use and drink, I would do anything uh, to feel that way today. You know, I feel like my feelings are going to kill me every day honestly. But, um, for anyone who's new, it's still better. It's still better because when you don't pick up a drink or a drug, things do eventually get better. And, uh, I don't know. I speak only for myself, but nothing was ever getting better. It was like at the end of my road, it got to the point where it's like, I had to have my little cocktail of stuff. And I tried to lie to myself and tell myself that I wouldn't want to die the next morning, but it was inevitable. It was inevitable. I couldn't shake the depression. I couldn't, like, the physical, mental, 
spiritual like i i wish i could remember it more clearly but you know literally my goal was to poison myself as much as i could uh not without a you know every day every day all day um when i was in about second grade uh i i think my behavior changed a little bit i started having tantrums um I'm very paranoid of my first sponsor that I went through the steps with just drilled into me that I was always in self-pity. And I think, I guess I'm kind of blaming her for that. And that's kind of against what I stand for. But my sponsor now today is kind of like occasionally will be like, well, I think that's different than self-pity. But yeah, anyway, I pitied myself and I found myself like going to the closet to cry and screaming and like attention seeking like like right here attention seeking um and you know i remember that day my mom raised her voice at me which didn't happen very often and she said you're taking over the house like a queen bee and that like devastated me and she was sick and tired of it i could tell but she didn't um, my mom thinks that I, she enabled me. She blames herself. My mom is also one of us, and I'm very blessed that I followed her on this path. She, she was done about two and a half years before me, so I have... My favorite woman in my life who understands everything and she almost knows everything now. So I'm very, I got very blessed in that capacity. Um, I started, I, I never felt a part of with, um, among the girls that were the same age as me, um, ever. I'll never know if I set myself apart. My brain is telling me I set myself apart, just like I did in the playground, remember? I didn't, you know, same thing, reoccurring theme, but I didn't look like them. My parents didn't have bank accounts like their parents had. They were skinnier than me. But the girls that were two years older than me thought I was so cute because I dressed different and I was a weirdo. <laughs> and so I started hanging out with them because they would give me that validation that I'm addicted to, to this day. They would give me that attention and validation, even if it was like they were just laughing at me. I didn't care. Um, so I... Slowly but surely, I remember going to one of their parties, smoking my first cigarette. I don't remember if it was my first drink, but I finally felt a little bit a part of. The next day, I was climbing up a tree to smoke more of those cigarettes while my dad was mowing the lawn. I'll never forget that. Next thing I remember is stealing, like, the years and years old, like, liquors in the in the basement of my house, like underneath the bathroom sink down there that my parents, cause my parents never entertained. My mom just drank her wine out of her coffee cup in the kitchen, but we never did the, like, it was Frangelico that I swear was like 15 years old. I, did I care? Of course not. So I just mix everything together. I remember getting drunk with a friend in my room, just like, you know, um, all I knew was that I felt differently and farther apart. And I did kind of feel like I was, I was cooler. Um, I started shoplifting. Um, it took, took me a few times. I started smoking marijuana, it took me a few times for it to take, but I started and, uh, experimenting with other drugs, like as time went by. Um, the first time I met my drug of choice was after a visit to the dentist. So to this day, 
when I think about the dentist, someone talks about having surgery, anything having to do with injuries, that's that's where my mind goes because that was my saving grace. So I just like I cannot think about those things without being like none of my business, but going there in my mind. Um, when I was 15 or 16, I started harming myself. I started cutting. This was before I got real heavily into the drugs and alcohol because that took its place. But um, my parents had no idea what to do. Um, I'd come home from the library with like stacks of books, very dark, disturbing books. Um, and this was not attempts, suicide, not suicide attempts. <clears throat> I had suicide ideation. I have it today. Um, but I never had the balls to plan anything. Um, so I just continued cutting myself and, um, push came to shove and they decided to take me to Fairfax hospital where I stayed. I, I went there twice and, um, you know, I guess all that I can think of at this moment is, uh, what it must be like to be parents. You know, I'm not a parent. Um, the closest thing I can compare this to is um, being a friend of somebody who's going through that type of thing. Um, so that was in about 7th or 8th grade. At this point, I'm doing as just I'm just doing the stuff that grade schoolers do, you know, taking things to get intoxicated that aren't meant to be taken to get intoxicated. I remember um, the day when this see again chronological. I'm I'm doing okay, but not so not perfect. I remember the day when I noticed that my dad was sleeping in the office of our house and not in my mom's bed. So that happened. Um, I'm sure that my therapist would disagree when I say, I don't feel like the divorce really took my parents divorce really took a toll on me, not near what it took on my um, little brother, but I'm sure that subconsciously there's definitely some stuff going on there. Um, So I'm going to start talking about when when things really started going downhill. Um, I didn't know, I, I share this often, I didn't know my last was my last. I had no idea. Um, whatever there is out there that's keeping me clean and sober and giving me the opportunity to be here with you guys is the same thing that made me sober when I was sober. Um, I started going to AA meetings about a year and a half before my sober date. Um, my mom, I think, introduced me to meetings. I would wake up dope sick and hungover or still drunk, and I talk about it fondly. I would walk to Abigail's Ghost, which was the first meeting of the day that I could find, because I'd wake up come to, I'm sorry, I would come to at four or five in the morning, the lights are on, there's like, you know, the oven was on, you know, I've woken up with the shower on and the art in the bathroom curling off the walls, like, <laughs> um, I would, I would do what everyone does from what I've gathered. I'm going to clean up my life. This blows. I'm going to clean up my life. I have to clean up my li life. That was the last time I got to go to a meeting. So Abigail's ghost is, has a special place in my heart because I got my first 24 hour coin there. I'll never forget what he looks like. The, the elderly man that gave it to me, I've tried to find him, but I can't find him. I used to see him at Cherry Hall occasionally, but I haven't seen him for a long time. 
Um, I would show up and sit there and crumble. And for some reason, I wasn't afraid to tell you guys how much time I did or didn't have. Um, so, you know, when they say keep coming back, uh, I don't think it's cheesy anymore because that's literally what worked for me. It's like exactly what happened. I thought I'd never, ever make it. I thought I would never get it. But that's how it happened. Um, so I woke up last week in of March 2010 after I had um, lost my, my full-time job. Um, I had been disowned by my mother's side of the family, which is my s snooty, financially successful East Coast family. <laughs> um, if you guys have seen the movie 28 Days where she falls into the wedding cake, I didn't fall into the wedding cake, but I did about everything <laughs> except for that. And uh, my aunt just you know, can't, you know, behind my back all the way calls my mom as I'm on the plane flying back and says, you know, I don't want anything to do with you or your daughter. I'm sick and tired. You know, I'm sick and tired. Um, my little brother who I raved to you about earlier had lost all respect for me. He, he was my best friend when we were young. I was like, he like thought I was great. That was all done with. He's not one of us. He didn't get the gene. Um, I took medical leave at my part-time job. My part-time job was to save extra money, which you guys know what that means. I needed more money. Um, thank God for paying first and last in deposit because I had no money to pay any more rent. So my last month's rent was uh, paid for. Um, medication is a huge part of my story. It'll take up the rest of my time if I go into my story about that. <clears throat> but it was to the point where I could either afford what I really needed, the only thing that made me feel okay with myself, or uh, refill my psych meds. And that's, I mean, what are you going to choose? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, this is a regular thing, right? I love paying bills today. People think I'm nuts, but I love paying bills because they're not stacked on my table in neon pink envelopes. <laughs> so I really, it means a whole lot to me that I'm able to do that in sobriety. Um, I lost almost everything. I had been going to meetings saying, I still have a job in an apartment. <laughs> and my friend who was there said one day after, you know, hearing me say, say that a lot, and I hear it today, and I'm, I'm just, I'm exact, I was that person. He says, sweetheart, he's from, like, somewhere over there. You're gonna, you're gonna lose both of those things if you keep going. And he was right. He was absolutely right. So I had put a bunch of substances in my system, and alcohol, and they didn't work. And if you've ever been that person where it doesn't work, there's no words to describe how that feels. I mean, it's absolutely <laughs> demoralizing, and it's like you're drowning, and you can't. So I woke up with a headache, to say the least, and I remember praying on my knees with my head resting on my bed, and I'm like, I can't do this anymore. And I accepted my 12th offer to detox, and I went to recovery centers of King County for detox for six days, and then I went to Thunderbird Treatment Center for 28 days. What it's like now, 
I can sum it up real quick. Um, I was clearly carried in my early sobriety. There were times when I, I, I just had no idea what um, was keeping me here. Um, I remember the first time I said no to drugs. That was a spiritual experience. Um, it was like someone was speaking in my voice that wasn't me inside. That's how I remember feeling. Um, my purpose no longer is um, doing what I used to do. My purpose is to say yes when someone asks me. I feel very flattered when somebody asks me to speak somewhere. Um, whether I should or not, I do. I feel very special. It feeds that validation attention thing that I was talking about earlier. Um, and it gives me a little bit of self-esteem. Um, I'm grateful for the steps. Um, I, I picked out something to read. <laughs> that applies to my life right now because uh the pain is more than the joy and peace and serenity right now this is from the 12 and 12 if i can find it um out of step 10 Someone who knew what he was talking about once remarked that pain was the touchstone of all spiritual progress. How heartily we AAs can agree with him. For we know that the pains of drinking had to come before sobriety and emotional turmoil before serenity. So about, um, I guess I'll just end with this. Um, about, let's see, what month is it? Okay, five months ago, I made, I was, um, not being honest with the love of my life, and it was making me spiritually and emotionally sick, and eventually physically sick, and, um, that's what the steps have done for me. I can't be dishonest without severe consequences. I've, I've been through it. I know it. it. It's like, I can't, I can't do it anymore. So, um, I decided to be honest and, um, I lost the, the most important person in my life. It's hard to give someone that title cause I have very many people in my heart, but, um, I lost a relationship of four years which is the longest relationship I've ever had, let alone the first relationship with someone in long-term recovery. Um, I decided that I couldn't live with the secret I was keeping, and it was worth it to not be dishonest, even if I lose the best thing that I've ever had. And um, even though I've been in the lowest, darkest place, I can sleep a little better at night, which I don't do very well, knowing that I'm not keeping a secret. And it's because of these steps, and I, I uh, can only remind myself that um, I'm very much not in charge of anything except for my responses and reactions to things, but nothing else. Um, sorry. Thanks, Perry. Um... So I'm going to continue to raise my hand when people ask who's willing to sponsor. Um, I trust God will put a woman in my life when it's time. Until then, um, I jump at the opportunity to do stuff like this because my life depends on it. And um, 
I guess I'm happy and glad that I can't really see my path. I think it's best this way. My, um, couldn't handle it. My, my thoughts couldn't handle it. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity, um, to be here with you guys. I really hope that I said something that might help somebody come back. If, if you don't want to be here, you're here for a reason. And the thing that's amazing about this place is that, um, I've never seen anyone get turned away. And, um, all I know is I'm not trying to plan which bus to jump in front of so I don't have to go to work dope sick today. And I, I say that a lot, but it's cause it's really true. And that, that was a feeling that I wish I remembered more when I start to freak out about where I'm at. And my thoughts are trying, you know, my thoughts are trying to kill me. They're shape shifting and my, di my disease shape shifts and pulls all sorts of amazing stuff on me. So please come back. We need you here. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.